Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our panel on digital protectionism. Uh, I was just handed a note on the way in that said, please, please, please remind people to go down to the cocktail hour after the end of our session. I thought, I don't think we're going to need to remind people to, to hit the bar, but you're strongly encouraged to do so after the panel. Uh, my name is Nancy Scola. I'm a technology journalist. journalist excuse me, I cover the intersection of technology and public policy. Uh, again, this is our panel on digital protectionism. Uh, the topic here is sort of complex. The idea is that uh, as U.S. tech companies sort of continue to dominate the Internet uh, and there are growing concerns around the world about privacy and security, some countries have reacted by uh, taking steps to sort of strengthen their own corner of the Internet, uh, protect their sort of homegrown domestic uh, internet industries, and, and uh, that's raising some concerns here in the U.S. and sort of around the world as well. So we're here to discuss this with our terrific panel. Uh, we have a great group. Uh, to my left is Ambassador Daniel Sepulveda. Uh, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy at the State Department, obviously. Uh, to his left is Ambassador Miriam Sapiro. We have two ambassadors in a row. That's a <laughs> That's a coup, I think. Uh, she's the visiting fellow in global economy and development at Brookings and a former deputy U.S. trade representative. Uh, to Miriam's left is Andrea Glorioso. Andrea, Andrea is a counselor for digital ag agency at the European Union delegation to the United States. To Andrea's left is, let's check my notes here, Yael Weinman. Uh, Yael, Yael is vice president for global privacy policy uh, and the general counsel at the Information Technology Industry Council, or ITI, is probably better known in this room. Uh, and to Yale's left is David Chavern uh, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, where he is the executive vice president for the Center uh, for Advanced Technology and Innovation. So the way this is going to work is each of our panelists are going to give some opening remarks, about five, six minutes, uh, and then I may ask a question or two. Uh, and then we're going to throw it open to the floor, and we're really hoping to make this sort of a lively uh, back and forth conversation with, with all of us. Uh, so if you can think of your questions as our speakers are going along, that would be great. So we're going to kick it off, and we have first is uh, David to give a bit of an overview of the topic. Great. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased, uh, pleased to be here. For those of you who don't know, the, the U.S. Chamber is the uh, largest business federation in the world. When people ask me what we do, I say fun we do a lot of things, but fundamentally we tell the story that business is the answer, not the problem, that free enterprise is the answer, not the problem. And in particular, I was asked to establish at the chamber something called the Center for Advanced Technology and Innovation to particularly talk about the policy uh, choices that we have ahead of us that will either help uh, Te a technological evolution and revolutions in the U.S. and the U.S. economy or retard uh, U.S. leadership in technology. Uh, and on a number of fronts, we have choices on both ends, obviously things like immigration reform, education reform, infrastructure investment are all issues that technology companies care deeply about and where the right choices can help propel us forward and the wrong choices can help hold us back. But what many people may not know about the U.S. Chamber is that we have a very, uh, we, you know, we are globalists in perspective and have been for 102 years. Uh, almost a quarter of our staff is in our international group. And we spend a lot of time talking about um, trade, free trade, open trade, trade is good. Uh, and international commercial uh, relationships are uh, not only prosperous but good for peace uh, around the world. Uh, and in that regard, uh, we have sort of a convergence of, uh, of tasks, if you will, where I've been talking about technology and our international group has been talking a lot about fears, about protectionism broadly, but also in particular uh, about, uh, for want of a better term, internet protectionism or protect protectionism in the di digital realm. And I think, it, first, it's important to, as a sort of scene setter here, I think it's important to lay out that there are a couple of uh, parallel concerns going on here um, in, when you're talking about European uh, activism in the area in particular. The first is, uh, I, I think, a concern shared by uh, governments broadly, including the U.S. government, about how do you, as a nation state, what is your role in this thing called the Internet? Uh, you know, all of all governments are wrestling with the borderless nature of the Internet in a world where jurisdiction and rights and responsibilities and all those things are defined by borders. 
Um, and we have broadly gotten very used to this idea that the nation state is sort of the main building block of civilization, uh, but not here it ain't. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I had a, uh, a very close friend of mine who's a very, very senior former national security official. We were talking about this. And he was saying, you know, we absolutely need new international agreements to govern the Internet. The only thing is I'm just not sure that nation states are the right counterparties to that agreement. Um, uh, do, uh, what is their relevance in this uh, borderless world? It's certainly some, and they can certainly uh, cause problems. But aren't there uh, now the growth of these other uh, organizations that are really transglobal that have as much or more influence on what happens to the Internet than nation states do? So you have broadly, I think, a number of countries wrestling with what to do with this beast. The U.S. government, certainly, certainly the European governments, uh, Brazil, China, I mean, we can go down the list. Um, but uh, it does put at, at, at question the role of states in our new economy. And then you have the particular European fears, I think, about, uh, for want of a better term, cultural imperialism. You know, not only do the, na do the states in Europe not control the net like any other states don't, um, they are, there are latent fears that they will ultimately uh, be controlled by companies that aren't sympathetic to Europe or European points of view. Obviously, the big complaints today are about the uh, U.S. Uh, Internet giants, the Googles and Amazons, and, uh, and we can go uh, Yahoo's and go down the list. Uh, but really, uh, it, I think thoughtful people understand it doesn't stop there, and maybe it's the U.S. companies today and Chinese companies tomorrow. But in general, nobody's seeing a lot of European champions grow. Uh, and so there are these fears that this, this thing that's become central to their economies and the world economies will not have a European perspective. That's, a, I think, an additional gloss on the problem. And certainly there have been various attempts. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think they've necessarily been coordinated. I think they come out of a similar root of this fear of cultural imperialism. But whether it's the Google tax or the talk about a European cloud or um, you know, data, uh, data protectionism, antitrust complaints about Google, there was, you know, the, it was a great quote that, that you know, the French government blocked a bid by Yahoo to take a controlling stake in daily motion uh, and a French uh, economy minister said, maybe if Europe protected itself much better, it would be much stronger against the United States. You know, I don't, I don't know what that has to do with Yahoo in particular. But the, uh, the fact of the matter is it comes out of uh, this angst. Um, I, I would probably take the view, again, these aren't uh, coordinated. I think they'd be more effective. And if they were, <laughs> if they were coordinated, come from some central point of view. And I think it's certainly, if you look at the European experience, all of these things will, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, obviously fail, uh, but not without pain. Um, and if Europe becomes a blocking point uh, on Internet progress, the Internet will channel itself around uh, Europe uh, like water in a stream around a rock. Um, the uh, consumers would be hurt, but most important, European companies would not have the financial or economic environment in which they could grow to be champions, and there's no reason there can't be European champions in this space. Um, but the, if you're just talking about Europe itself, uh, it can do things that are difficult and expensive and annoying, but I don't think it's going to change the history of the Internet. What could, though, is if uh, uh, other countries decide to get on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, if China, Brazil, India, whatever, decide to follow the lead uh, of their own sets of these uh, nets that they're throwing over uh, the Internet, for want of a better term, um, you're not only creating a lot more pain, you're eventually retarding the development of uh, the digital realm itself. Um, and, you know, I, w the sad thing is I always come back to Europe is where free enterprise was born. Um, and if it wants to win in the Internet age, it should really go back and embrace those roots about innovation and, and free enterprise. Uh, because uh, what I'm afraid they'll do is, in, is uh, uh, spark uh, a whole set of circumstances that will really retard all of those values that we, that we hold so dear.
And so with that, I will shut up and uh, go down the list, and then we are happy to talk to you about whatever you'd like to talk Actually, about. I'm sorry, David. I'm just going to jump in with one quick question. Can you define the uh, European cloud for folks, just so we have some concrete example of well, what there, we're Well, I mean, about. I think that it, it, it's, it, it comes down to this um, uh, data indigenization arguments that, 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 uh, that data should be somehow physically kept in cloud, you know, an environment called the cloud that uh, that Europe that would stay in Europe somehow physically. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the the cloud is a uh, a broad term for the, the you know storage devices located all across the world where our data goes and sits till we want it back. Uh, and there have been expressions of interest of those data places being in the physical uh, uh, confines of Europe. Excellent. Thank you. Miriam? Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> I hope everyone can hear me all right. I'm getting over a little bit of laryngitis, but Danny's promised to hit me on the back if I start coughing. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here and to have the chance to talk with all of you about this topic. As Yogi Berra once said, the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> and I think that's especially true when we talk about the digital economy. There are legitimate worries about a backlash against U.S. companies, but at the same time, it's neither helpful nor accurate to look at this as a U.S.-EU competition or as a zero-sum game. The Snowden disclosures obviously have created great distrust and heightened uh, concerns that had already existed about whether the U.S. government and U.S. companies were taking privacy, pr taking privacy seriously. And that's trust that we need to figure out how to repair. At the same time, we're now seeing privacy concerns in Europe taking a back seat to greater fears about terrorism as a result of the tragedy in Paris. And this includes a desire uh, to start tracking uh, more closely certain individuals and also to place limits on what can be said and done on the internet. What's clear is that we need a thoughtful code of conduct for addressing the increasing tension between privacy uh, concerns and between legitimate use of information by governments to protect us. Other concerns like unfair competition and tax avoidance are also focused more on U.S. companies than on other companies. Are these views exacerbated by the economic problems that Europe is now facing? Probably so. Are the allegations and the investigations really protectionist? It's hard to tell. But there are other measures that Europe uh, has taken and is still taking that can favor EU companies that I think there are things we can do to address, and we can do those together. First, a bit of context. I think we have to try to change the perception that European technologists and innovators cannot compete fairly against those on the other side of the pond, on this side of the pond. It, it's simply not true. I think, and maybe I differ with David a little bit here, I think there are plenty of European champions. There was a study last year done that found that Europe, and it was Europe defined broadly, so it included uh, countries that are outside of the EU, but they produced 30 technology companies worth more than a billion dollars since 2000, while the U.S. produced 39. That's not a huge difference, and it turns out that in Europe there was actually a higher hit rate or success rate than um, there was in the U.S. So I'm bullish on EU entrepreneurship, and if you want more specific examples, uh, there was an excellent speech given by David Drummond, Google's legal office, uh, officer in uh, Lisbon at the council meeting last week that uh, has lots of great examples of this spirit and European success. Further, the real competition for Europe is not coming from the United States, but from companies in Asia and other fast or faster growing regions. So think of Alibaba, for example. It's arguably the largest e-commerce company in the world right now, and it's certainly one of the most valuable companies today after its debut on the New York Stock Exchange. It wasn't long ago that the largest IT company in the world was Samsung. That was about two years ago. And companies like Tencent and other uh, major players in the Chinese uh, marketplace 
are on everyone's list of hot companies to watch for 2015. So that's a bit of context. I think we also need to ask what can Europe do to create a more nurturing tech environment for entrepreneurship? And several factors come to mind. First of all, making the opportunity or the possibility of failure uh, more readily acceptable. I'm always struck by how differently failure is seen in the United States than in Europe. In the US, it's OK to fail. You pick yourself back up and you try again. But in the EU, it's still a stigma. It's given, it's actually, I think, uh, given that difference in perception, almost surprising how many European tech companies do succeed. Another factor is ensuring that there are uh, liquid capital markets that can help boost investment in startups. The decision last week by the European Central Bank to embrace quantitative easing can help in the tech sector if some of those funds find their way uh, to these companies that are uh, really hurting, hurting for capital. I also think Europe's determination now to truly create a digital single market will help so that all companies, US, EU, others, um, will not face as many conflicting uh, rules and regulations from, from 28 different member states. I also think on the education front, the Europe and also the US uh, really have a, a long way to go in ensuring that they are equipping their um, students and future employees with the technology skills that are going to be needed to compete effectively in this century. So uh, let me um, close with the third subject that I wanted to uh, mention, and that's how, how do we help persuade the EU to resist the temptation of protectionism and embrace more open policies? I said at the beginning that I think there are a number of measures that, that can be taken. And I'm not suggesting these are uh, important measures because of the U.S. interests here, but because of the European interests that are really at stake. So for example, when it comes to regulation, how can Europe boost the level of transparency, the level of participation, and accountability um, so that when it is regulating, it's embracing more diverse views and it's only regulating where it really needs to? There's nothing wrong with having very high standards, but again, looking at regulations as the US has in terms of whether we need them, um, because there are some cases where we have overregulated in the past. And the Obama administration has taken a real uh, uh, hard look at what regulations are no longer useful and no longer fostering entrepreneurship and innovation. It was actually Chancellor Merkel who said at Davos last week that the EU single market needs to become less regulated and more open. Now, an American can't say that, but a European can. And certainly the Chancellor of Germany saying that, I think, is a very powerful signal. And trying to open up the regulatory process is one objective of the transatlantic trade and investment negotiations that are now underway. So hopefully that, uh, that will continue to be an important aspect of those discussions. Another way to resist the temptation of protectionism is to open up the EU standard setting process. I'm sure many in this room have uh, either attended or tried to attend European uh, standard setting exercises and know what an essentially still closed shop that process is. But again, it strikes me that it's in Europe's interest to open this process up more so that EU standards don't just become embraced in Europe, but they become global standards that working with the US can again help both economies achieve a more level playing field and together compete more effectively against countries in Asia and other markets. So I think this would be an important step. And again, I hope that the TTIP negotiations underway will be able uh, to address that issue. Another way is to embrace the free flow of cross-border data. It's certainly not a new idea. The EU has been supportive of this concept in the US-EU ICT trade principles that were embraced a couple years ago. So I think that's another area where both 
parties can work together to make sure that that principle is embraced with, of course, protections for privacy concerns, as long as they're not, uh, they don't become an excuse for discriminating against companies from the other party. The last measure that I'll mention briefly is something that David alluded to as well, and that's prohibiting the use of localization measures that would require um, that servers be located uh, only in certain countries or that would require the use of local products, local services, local intellectual property rights. The EU and the U.S., I think, see eye to eye on this issue. Uh, much more than other countries do. So again, the transatlantic trade negotiations are an opportunity for the U.S. and the EU to come together and embrace a clear standard that perhaps one day the rest of the world will also see the wisdom of agreeing to. So these are a few steps that I think can help EU companies um, compete more effectively against U.S. companies. Um, but perhaps more importantly, help U.S. and EU companies compete together more effectively against companies in China and elsewhere. Keep in mind, as Chairman Ramirez said this morning, there are today uh, 25 billion devices connected to the Internet. That number is expected to double in the next two years, and the majority of those will not be in the U.S. and they will not be in Europe. So those are a couple steps that I think can be taken. It's um, based on the concept that fair competition increases exactly the kind of innovation and discovery that creates the companies tomorrow. If only we knew, sitting here today, what those companies are. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, one quick question, if it, and I can ask you maybe even a yes or no. Are, are when you say tech companies, Europe, European and U.S. tech companies are on equal footing? Internet companies fall under that umbrella wholly. It's they're on it as equal footing. The, the U.S. has no greater advantage when it comes to internet-centric companies than um, tech companies in general. That doesn't make any sense, does it? That's not what I said. It, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I just wonder if there's a distinction between internet native companies uh, and tech companies writ large. Maybe you can. No, I was I was embracing internet companies within technology. Okay. Okay. Uh, Andre. Thank you. I'm going to get the microphone closed because there is somebody who is speaking very loud in the other room. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to the organizer. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I listen very carefully, and I will listen very carefully to the observation of my colleagues. I would like to offer a couple of perspectives on the European position on this discussion. And I will start straight away by saying that I would respectfully challenge even the title of this panel. I think that the term protectionism uh, is an extremely loaded term, and we should be very, very careful to use it uh, uh, if we really want to have a discussion, if we really want to come to a common position. Now, if we're talking about international trade, uh, international trade rules, uh, there are very clear rules there that both the UN and its member states and the US uh, have agreed to in the WTO context, uh, among others. Uh, and in that context, it is extremely clear that there are exceptions uh, to the general rules uh, of uh, free trade in goods and services. Those, accept, those exceptions include the cases of protection of privacy, of essential security interest, uh, uh, of public morals even, and both the US and Europe and other countries which abide by those rules have used those exceptions. Now, to be very honest, I, uh, I think it would be unhelpful for me to make a full list uh, of U.S. measures uh, which might, I'm not saying that are, which might be considered protectionist from a European point of view. I can make that list uh, if that is helpful. Uh, but what I would rather like to point out is that it is a very clear principle in international trade that these exceptions are possible as long as they are not discriminatory, they are proportionate, uh, and they are meant to achieve a legitimate public goal. Now, of course, if you ask me, I believe that our rules uh, and the exception to the rules that we apply, to the international trade rules that we apply, meet all these three criteria. Now, it is perfectly fine that other countries and some of our trade partners uh, disagree with that. But the point is that we do have, we fought very hard to have an international trade system, uh, to have a global trade system, uh, and also in our bilateral relationship, we agreed that we would take concerns uh, over exceptions, over whether those exceptions, the practical implementation of those exceptions to the general rule of free trade in goods and services uh, are indeed proportionate and non-discriminatory and are meant to achieve a legitimate public goal. 
Now, I will be, I, I'm supposed to be a diplomat, but I'm not very diplomatic as a person. I'm really making an effort. Um, I must stay here in the US. Um, I do not think that shouting around the word protectionism, as has been done in the past months, uh, is helpful. Because if there really is a problem, then, uh, and I'm not suggesting that anyone should do that, but if there really is a problem, then there are the venues to address those problems. If there is not a problem, uh, what we are doing here is simply accusing each other of uh, things that are undemonstrated and we're poisoning the dialogue. I very much appreciate it, Miriam. I think you should be hired by the European Commission, actually, because I think you defended very well uh, some of the points of view of the, European, uh, of the European Commission. I agree, we agree that, and the European Commission has made, it very, uh, has made it crystal clear that we believe that the entrepreneurial environment in Europe uh, can be much better than it is currently. And there are several reasons why that is not the case, including, I believe, I personally believe that the uh, the concept of the acceptance of failure in Europe uh, is very, very low. And I think that's one of the main issues. And that is immediately apparent as soon as you get here in the US, as I did a few months back. That's something you see immediately. It's, it's so, so apparent. And I think that has to change in Europe. That is very clear. Um, now, let me also make another observation. And this echoes what uh, reinforces what Miriam said. We just reinforced the notion that you should be hired by the European Commission and help me <laughs> in this job. Uh, it is a fact that many of what in you, some in Europe call the over-the-top companies, the Google and the Facebook of this world, we could call them the internet service companies, uh, they are US-based. Uh, we are also seeing uh, a very significant growth uh, of similar kind of companies uh, in Asia. I mean, if you look at the recent quotation of Alibaba and Tencent in China, that was quite, uh, quite striking. However, when we talk about the general technological environment, uh, uh, allow me here to be uh, uh, proud of my European heritage. Uh, we created uh, Skype. We created Linux that is being used is the, is the operating system that is used uh, in the widest possible sense across the world. Every single device, if you have an Android phone, you're using Linux. That technology has been developed in Europe. We developed MP3, which is the silly, stupid uh, protocol, music format, uh, that has allowed every other, every music store, online music store in the world to succeed. So even though we accept a discussion on whether the entrepreneurial uh, GSM, you know, I, I could make a full list, but again, I don't think, just like I don't think it's a point for me to make a list of measures in the US which we believe uh, are problematic, let's put it that way, and there are venues in which we are discussing those, those difference of opinion that we have. I simply wanted to point out that we are under, uh, we do not have a complex of inferiority. I wanted to make it very clear. We know what we have produced. We know that we can succeed in this field. Uh, we know that on the other hand, uh, we are better off working together than continue to fight with one another. And this is why, allow me to insist again, uh, let's stop for a moment to talk about protectionism because there is no way, and I, I need to be very clear on this, uh, there is no way that we in Europe are going to stop uh, antitrust investigations against any player who has a 90% market dominance in Europe and we believe is abusing his dominant position. Now, <coughs> in these investigations, those who are investigated have ample means, ample means, many means to demonstrate that that is not really the case. We had plenty of discussions on that. Those investigations are still continuing. Not for one single moment, I heard uh, the company being investigated claiming that our activities, uh, I'm meaning filing, uh, formal filing, forget for a moment what people tell newspapers or tell the media, okay? That's part of the political game. But in filings, uh, not for once has anybody claimed that our investigation were discriminatory or were less than uh, completely abiding to the procedures that are followed. Uh, and by the way, the US and EU procedures on antitrust are not that dissimilar. That has to be followed in these cases. Similarly, when we talk about privacy, you know, you have to accept, and I say, that, I say this with a lot of respect for, for this beautiful country, but you have to understand that the notion of privacy and the level of uh, understanding of what is the appropriate level of privacy protection in Europe is fundamentally different than in the US. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse. It is different. There was a Eurobarometer, one of the regular surveys that the European Commission runs across Europe uh, to try and understand what people think about us. I usually don't like to read those surveys, but uh, <laughs> we try to understand what Europeans, what is important to European citizens in many different fields. And there was a very recent Eurobarometer survey in which a significant number of European citizens, uh, not the majority, but a very significant number, highlighted that when they go online, their first and foremost concern is that their personal data is abused. After that, uh, and long after that, comes that their financial data is abused. 
I don't think you would get the same result uh, in this or in other countries. That is, again, uh, doesn't mean that this system is better or that American people are right, uh, are wrong, and we are right. But the notion is different. So when you see the way that Europe approaches the discussion on data protection and on privacy, you have to take this into account. Again, we do not believe, nor has any claim been, uh, there has been no claim filed uh, in the appropriate uh, international trade dispute uh, uh, system, which has claimed that our rules uh, existing uh, or being discussed, our rules on privacy are discriminatory because they're not. Because in fact, uh, everybody laments our privacy rules, European companies and US companies and Chinese companies, everybody laments about that. So as we say in Italy, if everybody is equally unhappy, you must be doing something right. Um, now, one thing that I, uh, the last thing that I would like to, to point out uh, is, we know very well, and I have a personal experience, uh, that there have been, uh, in the context of political discussions, uh, tempers can run high. That is fine. It's, well, it's not fine, but it happens. Uh, there have been uh, words being uh, flung around. There have been accusations, uh, both from Europe to US companies and from the US to European companies or to European regulators. Uh, that is unfortunate. I don't think that should be the tone uh, uh, of the discussion. But certainly what, uh, and I mention it only because it was mentioned by, I think it was you, Miriam, who mentioned the Snowden case, the discussion of the NSA, that is something of which I do not wish in this context to, to discuss, to enter into too much of a discussion. But what I will point out is that you cannot expect, if you have, a, uh, and I will make just an example of this one company, but it could be applied to many other companies uh, from Silicon Valley. If you have sold yourself and your services uh, under the motto, don't be evil, and then uh, something like what has happened uh, happens, uh, you cannot be surprised uh, if there is a reaction, if people then say, well, you have not been totally honest with us. And uh, what I'm trying to, to, to point at here is that rather than using terms such as protectionism, which again really, you know, they really irk us when we're accused of being protectionist, I'm sure that would irk the US if we accuse you of being protectionist. Rather than use those terms, we should really try to be as honest and transparent and open to dialogue as possible because at the end of the day, we are and we are demonstrating that by investing a lot, uh, both sides of the Atlantic into TTIP, into the discussions on the trade and investment uh, uh, partnership, EU US trade talks, uh, that is taking a lot of time. There are colleagues from the US trade team who can agree with me that that takes a lot of efforts on both sides. We are doing that because we believe uh, in Europe and in the US, uh, we believe that we are better off together not against the rest of the world, but in a world that is changing, which competition is becoming global. And uh, frankly, accusations of protectionism, which are not, at the end of the day, backed by real data. And I hear a lot about accusations of uh, European cloud. Uh, people still have to show me where in European law there is something uh, such as what people are fearing. Fears are one thing, uh, and what is in the law is another. The law in Europe is very clear. Data can flow to the US uh, without any problem as long as certain conditions are met. Until now those conditions are met, you know very well that we are in discussion because we believe that the safe harbor agreement uh, can be made better and stronger. Those discussions are ongoing. I think they're perfectly legitimate discussions. Uh, but for the time being, I do not see in the text of the law nor being debated uh, measures that would amount to what people are accusing uh, Europe. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's just jump ahead. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I won't spend my few minutes um, focusing on the EU, mostly because I want to give you a little break, and uh, maybe I'll apply for that job at the European Commission as well. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit, m little bit more on, on the rest of the world. And you know, the title of this panel, whether we think we should change it or not, is are U.S. companies overseas facing a backlash? And if we want to give a yes or no answer to that question, I would probably phrase the question a little bit differently. Are U.S. companies overseas facing challenges? And the answer to that is yes. But the answer to that is not only for U.S. companies. It's, I think, all companies in the tech sector. And the point that 
my organization tries to make is that some of these policies are harmful not just to U.S. companies, not just to the sector, but, but industry-wide. So that's an initial statement, and now I'll take a step back. I love that Miriam started with Yogi Berra. I thought you were going to say it's deja vu all over again, but I think that's appropriate here, too, because when I uh, started at the Federal Trade Commission in 2002, it was just on the heels of the f first safe harbor negotiation, and here we, here we are again with uh, a renegotiation of safe harbor, and many of the same issues come to bear there. But I think the real question we're asking ourselves, is it different now? How is the, the backlash or the challenges, are they different now? And there's no question that the Snowden revelations made things feel a little bit different now because there are other equities at stake, other things that governments are pointing to as rationales for their po for their policies. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Can you just define safe harbor for folks to make sure that they know what? Oh, boy, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Three <laughs> words or less. about <laughs> seven years of my life on safe harbor, <laughs> so, uh, and continue to spend more. So um, as Andrea said, the EU has a different approach to privacy from the United States, not necessarily better, just different. Um, however, the EU has a restriction on cross-border data transfers that only companies that have an adequate level of protection can receive data from the EU. And sadly, the U.S. has not been deemed to have adequate privacy protection because of the framework that we have, and that was a European Commission decision, and we can talk about that another time. Um, so there's a workaround that was developed in 2000. The safe harbor is not an agreement. It, it's not a, in a treaty ratified by Congress. It's called the safe harbor framework. And it's what companies affirmatively agree to abide by a certain set of principles that are administered by the Department of Commerce. And there's a Department of Commerce rep right over there if you have follow-up questions. Brian Larkin in the office that administers safe harbor. So companies make these. <laughs> Can you raise your hand, make sure that. It wasn't a very enthusiastic <laughs> thing. <laughs> so companies make these commitments, and then those companies are deemed safe. Those, so the, thus the safe harbor. Um, and then, uh, data can flow from the EU to those companies. And the safe harbor framework is what has an adequacy determination. So I hope that explains it for those who That's great. Thank don't you. live and breathe safe harbor. <laughs> Um, so again, how does this feel different? The safe harbor renegoti renegoti renegotiation now does feel a little bit different because of the different climate. We're not just, just talking about the commercial sector, but we're also talking about government access to data. So I think that resonates all these policies. So I know we want to leave time for, for robust questions. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in other countries that are, are, are quite problematic. And Miriam touched upon this, data localization, and uh, David touched on it as well. We're talking about server requirements. Countries are requiring that companies store data on site in country, which for obvious reasons can be very inefficient and can, can lead to uh, inefficiencies that in, in, in many ways um, don't solve the problem that the country is trying to address. So if a, co if a company leaves a market, you haven't accomplished anything. You might require that they store data, but if they're not there anymore, then what have you accomplished? You, you haven't led to any type of economic growth. So server localization, local t content, requiring that companies partner with local companies, these are all examples that make doing business a lot more difficult. And we're seeing these types of measures in Russia, in Nigeria, in Indonesia, in China. We almost saw it in Brazil with the Marco Seville legislation. There had been a data storage requirement in there that was pulled out at the last minute. And I will say that this is not just a U.S. company or U.S. tech sector issue. You're seeing local trade associations on the ground talking to their own governments, saying these are problematic policies for our own businesses, for our own local businesses. and. The best example of that is in Brazil, where the local trade association said, this is bad policy. This is bad policy for local industry. And, um, and you see that in Russia as well, where the local companies, the Russian airlines, said it's going to be very, very difficult for us to comply with this law. So I think we need to uh, change the narrative a little bit. You know, our, is the tech sector facing challenges overseas? We can 
find a better phrase from digital protectionism, but I think the conversation is, is the same. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. You need a microphone. Don't you? This one. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all y'all for being out here this late in the day. I know you've sat through a number of panels and I appreciate you sticking this one out. Uh, I'd like to associate myself particularly with the comments of, of Ambassador Shapiro. Uh, they, they pretty much articulate what the U.S. position is on these questions, so I don't really have to reiterate that. Um, and, and also with Yael on the points relative to protectionism as it's actually manifesting itself in multiple markets around the world that are outside of Europe. And for the purposes of balance, I, I want to point out that um, in our international negotiations, when I'm at the International Telecommunications Union or at, uh, at the OECD or at Net Mundial or at any other forum, I can tell you that right now that there are, we have no better ally, no better friend than Europe. Um, consistently and, and uh, with both discipline and information, uh, our European colleagues are able to manifest very strong arguments against what have been very bad proposals in a number of fora and with which uh, we work with them uh, hand in glove. Uh, there is significantly more that unites the United States and Europe on all of these questions than there is that divides us. All of that said, um, friends can and do disagree from time to time. Uh, whether or not you want to label any given policy protectionist is, is I, I would argue, argue, I would argue is, is, is a term that should be used very carefully. Um, we can disagree, and, uh, and I think we do, relative to the, the current construction of the proposals for, uh, for the privacy directive and regulation being constructed out of, out of Europe as to whether or not it's good policy without declaring it protectionist. We can also uh, disagree relative to whether or not uh, data localization initiatives or requirements for a, a European cloud, for example, are protectionist. Uh, they may very well be intended to be rooted in other public policy values. The, but what we can bring to the table and argue and have argued and will continue to argue is that data localization requirements or the imposition of technical mandates uh, for reasons other than those that are voluntary and chosen by the market are generally bad public policy and will not solve the underlying problem that is being uh, that is being, that is trying to be articulated. So m my job, our job, I think, as the United States government is, is not to ensure that American firms get special treatment abroad, but it is to ensure that they get fair treatment abroad. And of course, any given market in any given jurisdiction is free uh, to write the laws for the participation in their market that they see fit. And we can only, we can only offer our thoughts uh, in that process, and we do so in good faith. And we will continue to do, continue to do that uh, in Europe and elsewhere abroad. But again, I want to reiterate the underlying point that we have very, very good lines of communication with Europe. And, it, and I would say, as a general rule, there is no friendlier market, not just for our goods, uh, but also for our ideas than Europe. And, uh, and we can build on that. Excellent. Thank you. OK, questions. Let's, uh, do folks have them? <laughs> no one. No one's prepared a question. I'm going to call on someone if I. Okay, Everybody's excellent. Tweeting. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could give your name and if there's a relevant affiliation. Um, and I was going to say if we could keep them concise in the hopes of covering a bunch of questions, but since we don't seem to have other ones, <laughs> feel free to, uh, sure. to go on. David, the RCDC chapter of the Internet Society. Um, Andrea, although Linux may have been invented in Europe, it was, it's based on C. <laughs> uh, the other part of this title was about digital protectionism. We talked, uh, there was very robust conversation about uh, data storage laws and privacy impacting digital commerce. Can you give other examples of what digital protectionism is and how it impacts business? Sure. I, I think that. Um in the first instance, any sort of requirement for local manufacturing, for example, uh, there have been some initiatives in markets, including India, for a requirement that it, that you purchase and produce equipment that will be used 
for communication sharing or digital uh, economy activities be produced or some percentage of it be produced in, in the given market. Um, there are, there are uh, also this, this sort of data localization uh, questions around the world uh, for a variety of reasons and that, that would break up the efficiencies of the cloud. Uh, but there's the, the other example that I would give is efforts to use standard making bodies, uh, particularly the ITU, by countries uh, like China in particular, but others, uh, to mandate what is their domestic technical standards through international standard setting bodies on the entire world. And that is a form of a manipulation of the political process and an international body that would have uh, fairly devastating effects for innovation. Uh, and, and to the, the degree to which um, countries wish to make their standards available in a competitive process through the voluntary standard making system of the world, you know, more power to them. And I think that, that you're seeing more people enter that process. Uh, so that, hopefully that answers your question. Sorry, Ross. <laughs> Andrea. Go ahead. No, I, I think Danny laid it out very well, and I touched on a few of those um, briefly. Um, and, and I would add to what Danny said, it's, it's protectionism in general to have local content requirements. So, you know, whether it's on goods or services or intellectual property um, or content when you're talking about multimedia, uh, it's a serious concern because it impedes trade in general. So here we're talking about a subset of that. You know, what happens when governments um, impose these kinds of requirements on digital trade? And um, I think it's the consensus of the panel that it's very short-sighted and counterproductive if your goal is, in whatever country you're doing this, um, to build a vibrant internet economy that can interface with the rest of the world. Well, not quite consensus because we have Andrea to. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I didn't want to break that consensus. I, <laughs> I think that, and I fully agree with Danny, with Ambassador Sepulveda, and that is something I, because I repeat it every time I, I, I'm on a panel, I sometimes forget that I should say it. I, it is our opinion that there is a lot more in common between the U.S. and Europe than either of the two have with the rest of the world, and we should never forget that in these discussions. I wanted to react, however, to David's first point uh, because maybe you you made it as a joke or as a joking point, but I think that that really highlights the fact that, yes, Linux might have been invented or developed first in Europe, but it is based on technologies, on a programming language in this case, which was invented in the U.S. But what this highlights is that, in particular in the ICT and the information communication technology sector, there are so many, uh, it's very difficult to simply point out to any technology which is not dependent on other technologies. And because of the very strong links that historically exist between the US and Europe, you will be very hard pressed to find any innovation, either in Europe or in the US, uh, that you can really claim is purely domestic. And it is not dependent uh, on very good cooperation and very good uh, trade and services and goods between the two countries. That is something that is absolutely clear to us. The reason why I made the example, that, that example is that not because the panelists uh, highlighted it, but I must say that in the narrative uh, around digital protectionism, there is, even within Europe, there is this idea that, oh my God, we are, you know, we are completely behind the curve and we are unable to produce anything innovative, and that is simply not, not the case. Uh, on, you also ask about examples, uh, so sorry to insist on this, but I think we should be careful when we talk about local content requirements on local da data localization proposals, etc. If we talk about a strictly trade perspective, what is relevant is whether these measures, uh, to the extent that they are an exception to the general rule under GATT and GATS, under the relevant WTO agreements or bilateral agreements if they exist, those, the, the point is if those exceptions are discriminatory in nature, they are not proportional, and they're not meant to achieve a legitimate public goal. These are the criteria. And in that case, uh, I think that we are uh, justified to talk about protectionism. Because the problem is that, again, and I don't want to make a list, uh, don't force me to make a list, it's not my job here, but there are measures in the U.S. on access to wholesale uh, list lines for telecommunication services, for example, that we consider protectionist. 
So you see, the argument goes both ways. The argument of the U.S. is that these measures are proportionate. They are meant to achieve a legitimate public goal, etc. We disagree, but as Danny said, France do disagree. That is not that is not an issue. But the the continued use of this term protectionism, I, I really think, is a uh, is going to be very con- counterproductive, especially when we go and try to convince other countries around the world that their measures, which are much worse than anything that is coming up in the U.S. or in Europe, when we try to convince that their measures are problematic, because they're simply going to point their fingers back at us and say, why are you talking to us when you are even, you, you are quarreling among yourself, you can't even agree among yourself uh, who is protectionist and who is not. That is the danger that we should keep in mind. Uh, Nancy, yeah. Um, I want to s- make one point about, you know, objective criteria versus subjective criteria. And at the end of the day, you know, what, what we try to do as, as a trade association is drill down and talk to a jurisdiction and find out, well, what exactly are you trying to accomplish with this policy? And then we rely on the thinkers, and th- there are several in this room, you know, one at the table at, at, trade, at um, think tanks, to actually help us with the economic argument. Oh, you're trying to grow your local economy? Well, if this kind of policy is going to be harmful to SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. So, you know, we need to take it away from, um, you know, characterizing something as protectionist or not, and actually, at the end of the day, make an economic, make an econo- economic argument, and that's something that we, we often try to do. Did you have one? Oh. I'll, I'll pass. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, excellent question. Mark McCarthy with uh, SIIA. Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, going back to those two principles that you articulated from the agreement a couple of years ago in Europe, uh, no localization uh, and free flow of information across borders, there's been some discussion of incorporating those principles in trade agreements, either ETIP with the Asian Pacific community or TTIP with, with the European community. Um, could you or anybody else on the panel want to speculate a little bit about so just to make sure everybody heard that it's about the inclusion. There's been this promotion of um, principles and trade agreements about data flows, ensuring the free flow of data. What's the likelihood that actually becomes uh, enacted? Well, uh, being out of government, I certainly can't predict what's going to end up in the final text. Uh, maybe Andrea can. Um, but what I will say is I think the U.S. and the EU, several years ago, we came together and we had tough negotiations on establishing these principles for uh, ICT trade, but we were able to reach consensus. And then together we went out, uh, sometimes together, sometimes separately, we went out to other trading partners to ask them to embrace these same basic principles. Let me recognize Rob Tanner, who's sitting very modestly in the front row, but Rob was um, on my team at USTR and still is at USTR and is, is our, uh, the government's leading expert on ICT trade issues and played a critical role in developing the principles and then persuading partners like Morocco and Jordan, Japan, and others to adopt them. So we could slowly spread the word, spread the commitment. They're not legally binding obligations, but they're high-level political commitments that these are important principles. And so we know the U.S. has said that it would like to see these principles adopted in 21st century trade agreements. So I'm hopeful that that will end up being the case. I think the fact that we did this with Europe, and we've also done this with some of our partners in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, certainly bode well for reaching uh, eventually, there are many, many other issues in both uh, agreements, but eventually I hope reaching consensus on the importance of these commitments as obligations. Uh, so first of all, just to clarify, because on, on whether there is consensus on the panel that uh, trade in online services is good, uh, yes, that is the case. There is consensus, I think. The U.S. and Europe are the two parts of the world which believe the most in international trade, in open trade, and we have demonstrated it repeatedly. So on that, there should be no doubt. Uh, we might disagree on the specificities, as it is normal, but that we believe that open trade is good. That Please don't have any doubt about that. Uh, now, uh, on uh, on the issue of uh, data flows and data localization measures in TTIP, which is what I can talk about because TPP is 
an agreement that is with other parts of the world, even though, of course, we, we also follow very with great attention what's happening on that front. Uh, but when it comes to TTIP, now I, w I cannot and I would not go into the details of the negotiations. Uh, you might like it or not, but those are the instructions I work under. What I can say, however, that yes, indeed, there have been discussions on that inclusion. From our perspective, we would like to understand uh, better what it is in the current system, uh, and I'm focusing now specifically on data flows uh, aspect, uh, because on the data localization, we, we we just don't see where the problem lies, to be very frank, uh, because we think that at the end of the day, to the extent that, uh, uh, again, these measures are non-discriminatory and proportionate, etc., countries should have the leeway to decide, uh, for example, for reasons of security, to keep data within their territory, as the U.S. does, by the way when it comes to the reasons of national security. But leaving aside this for a moment, uh, on the issue of data flows, uh, what we would like to understand a bit better is what it is in the current system that we have, as Yael explained very, very well, we do have uh, a framework in place, uh, which is currently being discussed, and I'm personally very confident that it will be solved, that the, the problems that we might have at the moment will be solved. We do have a framework in place which allows for the transfer, and there is a lot of transfer of data between Europe and the US. So if that is the case, uh, where is the problem? Because normally, you know, any government, whether it's the US or the EU or any EU member state, uh, will be hard pressed to put anything uh, in a trade agreement uh, if there isn't a problem that that particular measure is trying to solve. You know, because we don't like to overregulate, and we are putting, if we put binding commitments there, we would at least try to understand what is the issue. Now, we have been having discussion, discussions with our US, USTR counterparts. I think we're clarifying each other. We are not, uh, uh, as long as we're not talking about privacy and personal data, and that I had to be extremely clear, we have been very clear from the very start. Our negotiating mandate from the Council, from a EU member state, is very clear because the protection of privacy and personal data is a fundamental right in the European Union, that is not a topic of a trade negotiation, full stop. Whether that is with the US or within, with any other country, we don't negotiate trade, uh, we don't negotiate privacy in trade. But data is a lot broader than simply personal data. So we are simply discussing to understand why do we need uh, any measure in place? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? From our perspective, data is already flowing. We have the system in place, uh, and we are confident that we will have a uh, we will continue to have discussion. If if it's appropriate for both parties, we will come to an agreement. Uh, I think your question was also whether we. I don't. I don't know. I don't remember. I didn't understand if you asked us about a timeline, about that. Uh, I won't give you one. Uh, I can tell you that, of course, it is no. It is the political commitment of both parties to come to an agreement, to a good agreement, uh, as soon as possible. Ideally, even within this year. That is the political commitment. TTIP is a very, very large agreement which covers a lot of topics, so people have to keep that in mind. It's not only an ICT agreement, which maybe would make things uh, slightly easier. Is, is there someone who can um, answer, what is the problem? Andrea sort of raises this question of, what is the problem of data localization? In sort of simple terms, why is it bad? <laughs> On the technological? I, 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 twofold. Um, I'm not a, technolog a deep technologist in that sense, but network management uh, it makes it very hard, okay? okay. Uh, by the way, you also have to figure out what's local data, what's not local data, and somehow track it that way, not easy. Um, and inevitably, if you're from the company's perspective, inevitably it's gonna fail sometimes, right? I mean, when you're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of pieces of data, uh, you're gonna, uh, uh, you know, something's going to get on a server it shouldn't get on, and so it just seems to be a license to uh, to pun <laughs> to be punished, right? I mean, it's 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 almost begging to be to be punished at some level. So, it, it, you know, it, without any great point. Excellent, thank you. Um, data localization; those two words, they're not dirty words. A company may decide to store data locally, but that's a market-driven decision. It shouldn't be mandated by the government. So I don't think those two words are dirty, but it's just when it's mandated by a government and not by hmm. market efficiency. Um, okay. I think that's an important thing to remember. I think Rob has some <coughs> question, actually. So, um, Andrea, I just have a question for you. Um, I'm really would like to understand the European notion of privacy as a fundamental human right. Uh, today, the head of the European, the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer made a public statement that the European privacy regime was, was hurting and limiting oncology research in 
here, it would seem to me that life is a fundamental human right, and that here you have a potential tension between you know, the use of data to advance uh, healthcare, particularly to cure cancer, as we do in the US, we think called the Cancer Bioinformatics Grid, where NIH collects data from cancer patients all around the country. And that is more difficult to do in Europe. How do European policymakers do that? Do they understand or recognize that, that there's a trade-off here between other values and just prioritize privacy, or do they not see that there's a trade-off? Did everyone hear that question? Yes. You all got it? Uh, so I'm going to try to simplify this. Um, the When privacy and other sort of human values are in competition, does privacy always trump in Europe? And the example given was the use of data for uh, sort of cancer treatments and that sort of thing and sort of how do you weigh those in your cancer research um, and just I know I failed on this with other questioners but just your name for the excellent thank you thanks Rob um, well if I may start with a joke you're asking me what European policymakers think or do not think that's a very loaded question because those are my bosses so you know <laughs> whatever they think by definition is right <laughs> but uh, um, more seriously no. <laughs> More seriously, uh, now I will say straight away that I, I don't know the details of that letter that you mentioned. I would like to know more about that. Uh, but it is not the first time that uh, associations or uh, companies or organizations uh, have uh, claimed, uh, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong, there have been that argument that European privacy rules are um, overreaching. They are. Uh, if you accept my personal experience, uh, most of the time uh, that comes from a misunderstanding of what European privacy rules actually say. Because if you look at the current directive and also the regulation, the new regulation that is being debated, uh, there is a very long list of exceptions uh, to the general rule that you need to, that processing of personal data is only possible if you get consent uh, or on other legal basis that exists. There are a number of exceptions, one of which uh, is actually research. For research purposes. So my experience is that very often uh, uh, people simply assume, because maybe they're not privacy experts, uh, they simply assume, oh, I can't do this. Uh, and then we actually sit with them and show them, no, you actually can, uh, because at least as long as EU law is concerned, then member states may transpose that law in different ways, which is why we, now we are aiming at a regulation which is directly applicable in all member states. But without getting into the details, uh, that is my first reaction. More to the point that, or to the second part of your question, to the extent that we see uh, in the EU, we see the protection of privacy or personal life uh, and the personal data as fundamental rights, uh, that means that those are part uh, in the EU of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, uh, in the Council of Europe system, which is broader than the EU in the Convention on the Protection of Human Rights. And those two binding laws, uh, both constitutional level, I would say, they include a number of fundamental rights or human rights, one of which is the right to life, the right to property, the right, you know, I won't make you the full list, I'm sure you know them. And it is very clear that this is a basic principle of human rights law, and it applies also to European human rights law, that these rights have the same standing. It's not to answer the simplified question of, uh, of the moderator, absolutely it is not the European, it is not true in the European system that privacy trumps other rights. This is as, as, as far as the legal system is concerned. Now, frankly, depending on the member state that you visit, uh, certain member states are very sensitive on the topic of privacy, others are less. Uh, you might, talking to people, you might feel that some people in certain parts of Europe uh, would prefer that privacy was less or more protected. That is part of the social diversity and cultural diversity we have in Europe. But as far as the law is concerned, it is absolutely not correct to say that privacy would trump in any case any other right. And in fact, we have plenty of judgments of the European Court of Justice or national courts in which privacy was considered relevant but not that important to uh, deny other rights or to, 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 to prohibit people from performing, active, from performing activities that would infringe on the right to privacy. It's, it's a balancing act just like you have in, the, in your US system. It's a balancing act between different rights. Go ahead. Um, I want to make a point that addresses a bit of what Rob was asking, but also back to Mark's question. It, we've been talking on this panel, uh, putting aside the name, which I think was good because it got us all going and charged <laughs> Excited up. Excited. Uh, right. Well, we've been talking about the US-EU relationship, and we've also been talking about the rest of the world, both US uh, interaction and also US-EU interaction, and of course, EU interaction with other trading partners. Um, as Danny said, Ambassador Sepulveda, we've had fantastic cooperation with the US and the EU, even on localization. 
issues, mm -hmm. not giving any state secrets away from my last uh, job. Um, but we work closely with Europe. We continue to work closely with Europe. You made the point, Andrea, that we already have a lot of data flowing back and forth. You know, do we really need new rules? I think that's sort of going to what Mark was asking as well. Well, you know, we have a lot of trade flowing back and forth, nearly a trillion dollars, another three or four trillion in investment. So we have a huge relationship between the U.S. and the EU. So some people ask, well, do we really need a trade agreement? And after a lot of uh, in-depth analysis and thought and uh, discussions, very intense discussions, as, as Rob will remember, um, both sides decided that, yes, we actually see great benefit to launching a trade negotiation that both sides hope will be successful. So I think part of the challenge in TTIP, as it's known for sh uh, short, is to figure out what's going well in the relationship, but we need to embrace in a trade uh, agreement so that those commitments um, become the norm, the norm for other countries that we both, uh, US and EU, both have to work closely with. In other cases, it's um, other issues where perhaps one side, you know, sees great potential towards making changes and how the other side approaches uh, questions in the past. And I think there, you know, each side has an offensive agenda, a defensive agenda, but there's also a, a part of this that's really focused on how can the US and the EU come together, reflecting where they have much more commonality than differences, but nonetheless putting them down on paper so that they can send a very powerful signal to the rest of the world. Because no decision's been made yet on whether TTIP will become an open platform for bringing, at some point in the future, other partners on board. So that decision was already made in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Any member of APEC can raise their hand and say, we'd like to be considered for membership in the TPP partnership, and here's why we're qualified. So it's not at all automatic. It's, it's a rigorous, let's call it application uh, process, even though it's not really called that. So I think um, given that one day TTIP could be open to others, it's even more important that these standards in the agreement be high and they really be um, uh, modern. That they, and, and not just where we are today, but that they look to the future because you know, we know in, in 10 or 20 years, we'll still be saying that the future ain't what it used to be, and it'll be deja vu all over again. So how do we write those rules now so that they will still work and they will help the U.S. and EU compete together more effectively elsewhere? Danny, do you have a, a last brief comment? Uh, yes. Um, and I'm not sure it'll be that brief, but... <laughs> well, the bar opened a minute ago, so there may be uh, a revolt if we don't know. Y'all make a run for it if you want. <laughs> I think what, what I would like to say is, is our primary objective here is to ensure that the tools that uh, are the internet economy and the digital economy have been able to create are made available to as many people as possible, not because they're in and of, in and of themselves, but because of what they enable. And at the end of the day, we believe, the United States believes, that these tools, the ICT tools in general, enable wealth creation and opportunity across uh, economic sectors. So well, I think yesterday you asked me a question about isn't it convenient that you're essentially arguing for public policies that Google and Facebook and others uh, within our within the United States advocate abroad. Um, it, it certainly makes my job easier but we also generally believe, genuinely believe that it is in the public interest to have as frictionless a digital economy around the world as possible and we will object to public policies that restrict the free flow of information because they deter from the human empowerment that's possible through the digital economy. Now, that does not mean that there are not good public interest reasons to have laws. It is simplistic and incorrect to say that the EU doesn't care about innovation, and it is equally as simplistic and incorrect to say that the United States doesn't care about privacy. The question becomes, how do you enable the pursuit of both public policy goals in a way that balances the two desired outcomes. And at the end of the day, this administration has put a significant amount of effort in everything from John Podesta's big data report to a green paper and a white paper, I forget which one did which, but commerce and the FTC, the Internet of Things report that came out today. 
we are seriously examining both the public issues involved and the private issues involved in, in these uh, occurrences. What we would argue is that industrial policies directed at trying to create a homegrown ICT network through a process of blocking entry to goods and services is bad public policy. And we will continue to fight it in every possible venue around the world. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and uh, it's great that there seems it seems to be the subject of more and more public conversation, not amongst just the folks that attend this sort of conference, but uh, more broadly. So I hope that continues. And thank you so much for being a part of it. And thank you all for coming. Um,